everyone and welcome back to the channel. In today's video, we are going to be taking a look at my top 10 watercolor tips for beginners. Ish. This video has been requested many times over the years, but due to how many watercolor beginner videos that are on YouTube, I was always a little bit hesitant to add my own to the mix. However, I have spent some time with my thoughts on these beginners tips, and I hope that I can put my own spin on it. Of course, for those of you who know me, means that I'll probably have a tendency to go into a little bit too much detail for a true beginner's video, so if you are interested in just finding a basic, simple starting supply list, you might want to check out a couple of other YouTube videos first, and then come back here when you're ready for a surplus of information. For those of you who are looking for a little bit more in-depth way to start watercolor, I hope that it's a useful tool. Watercolor is a really complex medium, so I'm not going to be able to list everything that I want to in this top 10 style video, but I have compiled a large list of resources in the description below if you'd like to learn more about a particular topic that we touched on here today. Real quick today, before we get started, I just want to take a quick moment to thank our sponsor Skillshare. By now, I'm sure most of you already know about Skillshare since I am a top teacher over there, but just in case you're new to the art community and or this channel, let me go ahead and tell you a little bit about them. Skillshare is an online learning community with more than 25,000 classes in art, design, business, and more. You can join more than 7 million other creators to foster your creativity, curiosity, or even your career. A premium membership is less than $10 a month when billed annually, or $15 billed month to month, and gives you unlimited access to all the classes on the platform. If you're new to the platform and would like to try Skillshare for free, you can check out the link in the description below to receive two months of a free trial. I'll mention some helpful classes throughout this video, and you can check for the names of those classes in the description below, but for now, let's go ahead and jump on in to my top 10 watercolor tips for beginners. Unless you're in the small percentage of artists who can jump right into a project without any guidelines, you will need to start every painting with some form of line art. Whether you sketch your own drawings, copy tutorials, or even trace copyright-free photographs, it's important that you always start your paintings with a clean and accurate line drawing. The reason this is particularly important in watercolor is because it is a transparent medium, and any areas that are not painted darker than the pencil itself will show through. Furthermore, once you paint over graphite, even with just a light layer, the water will act as kind of a sealant once it is dry and you won't be able to erase the graphite. For this painting, I freehanded a sketch on printer paper using an old piece of my own artwork as a reference. Doing this step on inexpensive paper allowed me to be loose and free with the sketch itself, changing whatever I needed to along the way. However, once it was time to move on to my painting, I transferred that sketch on to my watercolor paper with a light tablet. If you don't have a light tablet, you can also use a bright window or even transfer paper. You can make your lines even lighter by using a kneaded eraser to lift the graphite further from your final sketch, ensuring that it won't show through. If you work on very small pieces, you might also be able to skip this step. However, for anything larger than a four by six inch painting, I highly recommend you secure your paper before starting to paint. While watercolor paper is made to handle water, it will still buckle when large amounts are applied. I typically work on paintings that are nine by 12 inches or smaller, and at these smaller sizes, I find that masking or painter's tape is completely sufficient for what I need it to do. However, if you wanna go the extra mile and or you work on larger scale paintings that are more prone to warping, I highly recommend looking into how to stretch your paper. This involves wetting your entire paper and firmly securing it to a board, usually with something like water activated tape or staples. I don't personally use this practice, so I'm not the one that should be teaching it to you, but you can look for other resources to teach you how to do that if you're interested. Alternatively, if you don't mind drawing directly on your paper or using transfer paper rather than a light tablet, you might want to look into blocks of watercolor paper. Watercolor blocks are sealed almost all the way around, holding the paper taut edge to edge. When you're done, you can gently detach the paper with a palette knife and ta-da, it's all set. Using thumbnail sketches to come up with compositions or dynamic poses for a piece is a topic for another video, but regardless of what you end up painting, I highly recommend the use of small thumbnails to plan out the colors in your work. 
This step may not be necessary if you are realistically painting from a photo reference or creating a spontaneous painting, but for everything else, planning out your colors ahead of time can really make or break a painting. Unlike oils, acrylics, or even gouache, watercolor is a transparent medium that usually is worked from light to dark. While we can sometimes lift the pigment from the paper or adjust colors by using glazes, it's generally quite difficult, if not outright impossible, to just change our minds halfway through a painting and turn something that was blue to now be yellow. For this particular piece, I was reimagining a piece I did back in 2015 of a mythological hippocampus. The original piece, which I'll show you at the end of the video, contained purples, blues, greens, and yellows. I knew for this one I wanted to simplify the color palette, but I wasn't sure how I wanted to go about it. Using thumbnails allowed me to imagine how different colors would look next to each other, as well as the overall color story of the piece. While using yellows would have brought the look closer to the real life leafy sea dragon that I pulled inspiration from, I decided to cut out yellow and green from the painting entirely and focus on dreamy teals and purples instead. As we finally gear up to start working on our actual painting, the next tip is a pretty simple one that you might have heard before. Use two cups of water while you work. One of them should be designated to clean out your dirty brushes, while the other one can be used to fetch clean water, and that can be brought to your painting. To further keep these cups clean, you can wipe your brush on a rag to get the majority of pigment off before the first rinse, and then proceed as normal. The single most difficult obstacle that most watercolorists face is mastering water control. It takes a lot of time and dedication to understand the relationship between the water that sits inside of your brush, on your palette, and on the paper itself. There are no shortcuts here other than to be mindful of your painting practices and to practice a lot. I worked my tush off creating my latest class on Skillshare, which covered this difficult topic in depth. It helps to walk you through exercises as well as a practical class project to learn how to use various techniques and ultimately find which ones work best for you. I also saw that Steve over at the Mind of Watercolor here on YouTube recently released a video on this topic as well, so I'll also put that link in the description if you want to check that out first. First and foremost, I want to put a disclaimer on this next section and to say to use what you have available to you. Something is better than nothing and you don't need the best supplies to paint good artwork. However, understanding what your tools are and are not capable of is hugely important for your own happiness and sanity as you learn to use watercolors. I have heard countless people say that they've given up on watercolors, that they just hated using them after only one or two bad experiences because they were using cheap supplies. As an extremely brief overview, cellulose or wood pulp paper holds water differently than a fully cotton paper would, and your washes are not going to dry as evenly no matter how hard you try. In the same vein, student quality paints will almost always be less pigmented than artist quality paints, which will make it harder to get deeper and richer colors in your work. As artists, we can learn how to self-correct and deal with these challenges, and if you have learned how to cope with these supplies while still making gorgeous artwork, then give yourself a pat on the back because that's an amazing accomplishment in and of itself. However, this tip is specifically for those of you who are frustrated that you can't get the results that you're looking for with your current art supplies. Are your paints always drying into pastel light colors? Are you getting blooms all over the place despite trying to be careful with your washes? Or are your brushes always sopping wet or completely bone dry? All of these might be issues stemming from your supplies. Unfortunately, I can't just tell you what to go out and buy because there are no best art supplies, only the supplies that are best for you and your style of painting. I cannot tell you also that by finding these perfect supplies or the most expensive supplies, that they will immediately allow you to create better artwork because we all still have to put in the time to learn our craft. However, by being able to find these supplies that you just gel well with, it can tremendously lessen the struggle and open up new possibilities. I talk about all of these supply concerns in more depth in the water control class that I mentioned earlier, but I also have a series here on YouTube called Top 5 and Top 10 Favorites. It's a little bit dated at this point and I still owe you the watercolor paper episode, but it's there if you want to take a look. Along with knowing your limitations of your supplies like paper and brushes, I'd also like to take a moment to talk about the pigments within your watercolor paints. Some artists learn what works and what doesn't through trial and error alone, and if that's how you learn best, then go for it. 
While I absolutely encourage this free form style of exploration, if you find yourself getting frustrated with specific paint colors or are just the type of person like myself who has an interest in learning more about them for the fun of it, I'd recommend digging a little bit deeper and spending some time getting to know your pigments on your palette. In a few moments, I might be speaking gibberish to some of you who are brand new to this medium, so rather than wait until the end of this section to let you know about additional resources, I'll drop them right here. I'll start by saying that I have an entire series called Color Spotlight that explores pigments one at a time, which will make all of this easier to understand. I also talk about pigment properties in two of my other Skillshare classes on watercolor mixing and palette creation to better navigate the choices out there when you're trying to put together a custom palette. Student and craft grade watercolors may not provide any pigment information whatsoever, but all artist grade watercolors should. Each specific pigment used in paints and manufacturing is assigned a label, such as PB15, which notes the color family and a standardized number for that color. In the case of PB15, that stands for Pigment Blue 15, which you'll know better as Thalo Blue. Thalo Blue is a transparent, staining, non-granulating pigment, which helps me as an artist to understand how it will react when I apply it to paper. It creates smooth, deep washes, and it would be hard to correct mistakes due to the fact that it doesn't lift off of the paper. These features are very unlike the colors that you've seen earlier in this painting, like manganese violet and cobalt turquoise, two colors that granulate heavily, creating texture across the entire area that they're placed in. These colors are easier to lift and correct mistake, but they won't ever really have that full smooth look that a lot of new watercolors are looking for in their paints. I hope that those of you who are interested in this subject have fun going through my other resources on this topic, but if not, let's go ahead and move right on to tip number eight. As I've mentioned before, watercolors are a transparent medium. Generally, watercolorists do not use white in the same way that other paint mediums do. Rather than adding white to lighten the color, we simply use more water. This reduces the amount of pigment in a wash and ultimately allows us to see through the paint down to the white of the paper underneath. This will lighten the overall value of the color in that area. You can still add white to watercolors if the look that you're going for is flatter and more pastel than pure pigments. However, this technique usually removes that ethereal luminosity that is so unique to watercolors, so I generally advise against it unless you're specifically looking for that aesthetic. To preserve the white of the paper in specific areas, you can also carefully paint around them or use masking fluid like I did earlier in this video to protect the paper. I also regularly use white gouache or ink to add highlights at the very end of the piece. While some purists may frown upon this, I love the pop of contrast and depth that it can add when used sparingly and purposefully. We live in a crazy day and age when platforms like YouTube and Skillshares are at our fingertips to learn just about any new skill we could want to acquire. YouTube, of course, is a free resource, and even Skillshare is incredibly affordable when compared to classroom or workshop learning. It would be foolish not to take advantage of these wonderful resources. However, whether you're learning from YouTube, Skillshare, Instagram, blog posts, or teachers in your own community, remember that one person's recommendation or guidance is not the absolute truth or only way to do something. It's important to be able to soak in new information like a sponge, but still retain the right and ability to expel whatever else you don't want to hold on to. I'm pretty sure that there's a life lesson in there somewhere too, but for now, we'll just stick with the art. I really strive on my channel to create useful, objective content that gives you information to make your own decisions. You'll never hear me say, buy this, it's the best, just that this is what I enjoy using and here's why. Sometimes I even go on to say, even though I don't like this for a particular reason, artists who enjoy this other technique might love it. Even if you're watching other content that isn't laid out for you in that manner, my tip to you is that if you're stuck on any given topic, go ahead and go out there and research it, get opinions from others, consider that information within your own situation, and apply whichever aspects of that you're looking to to improve your own experience. Nothing more and nothing less. My final tip is to paint what you love and to paint it a lot. In this video, you've been watching me repaint this hippocampus, which was one of the first full watercolor pieces I ever created back in 2015. 
While I typically paint real animals, and more specifically portraits of those animals, I also really enjoy animal-based mythology, and you may have even recently seen me brave the realm of human portraiture. However, aside from living, breathing creatures, you won't find much else in my portfolio. While I very occasionally paint still lifes, landscapes, or urban studies, I have almost zero passion for it. Hence, if I had tried to force myself to paint everything always, instead of sticking to just the things that I was excited about, I would have never lasted for as long as I have in this medium or career. There is certainly a ton that you can learn from dipping your toes outside of your comfort zone, but please don't ever feel like you can't fall back to what makes your heart happiest. As you can see, I have grown a lot in the last four years, and while there are many things that can be attributed to this, I think above all else is perseverance and constant practice. So keep painting, my friends, and I hope to see you here around on the channel. If you'd like to purchase this painting or order prints, you can find it over in my Etsy shop. And I just want to thank everyone for watching, commenting, and subscribing, and welcome those of you who are new to our little watercolor corner of YouTube. Thank you so much to Skillshare for sponsoring this video and to my patrons for constantly keeping this channel afloat. Until next time, happy painting.